the scene described by one investigator is reminiscent of a weird religious rite. The police released, released their only suspect in the mass murder of film star Sharon Tate and four others. Late last night, another bizarre murder in Los Angeles, the second in two days. The owner of a small supermarket chain found in his home, his head covered by a white hood, a meat fork stuck in his chest. His wife, 38-year-old Mrs. Lino LaBianca, found in the bedroom dead, her back brutally cut by a whip. He's inside, two bodies outside. They came and went, and the number varied from 20 to 30. Police said they were a pseudo-religious cult. People who worked on the ranch said they were heavy users of drugs. Were lurid. The movie actress was Sharon Tate, 26. The others were a male hairdresser, the heiress to a coffee fortune, a writer, and a boy just out of high school. A wandering band of members of a so-called religious cult with a leader they called Jesus has had three of its followers arrested in the investigation of the murder of Sharon Tate and six others. Those arrested are two women and one man, and the Los Angeles police said they would ask murder indictments against several others. Five women are being held as material witnesses. They called themselves the family. Los Angeles has had another multiple murder. Last night, a middle-aged couple was stabbed to death in a case that has striking similarities to the mass murder Saturday of actress Sharon Tate and four friends. We're taking dolls and stealing cars, and just they just sit around all day in peace and... That's about it. And went around collecting garbage and had that for dinner and went to the store once in a while. And that was about it. They just left and got loaded. People who lived with Manson on the ranch and in the desert denied that they were a violent group. They called themselves the family. We were playing. That's what the whole thing is. But we, we were, all we were doing out there was playing. You know. Well, what kind of guy was Charlie? He's a good person. A very good person. He's got a lot of peace. Was he out there all the time? I don't even know. You know, he, he take off over mountains just like deer. In a scene described by one investigator as reminiscent of a weird religious rite. On his body, the word war had been carved in the chest. Then, with blood, the killer had scrawled on the refrigerator door the words, Death to Pigs. Hello, and welcome to the Death Cast. I am your host, best-selling author Ian Tott, and I'd like to thank you for joining me as we prepare to take our fourth look at Charles Manson and the family those of you been following along, I apologize that the release of episodes in this series has been spotty. I have been traveling a lot for my day job, and it has necessitated some shifts in my personal life. Anywho, before we dive into it today, I have my normal plugs. If you'd like to follow me on social media, that would be Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, to me we can find me at either Ian Totten author or at the death cast if you would like to follow me on Twitter or on truth social just search for corpse Creek if you are interested in signing up for the show's mailing list just go to corpsecreekpublishing.com click on the sign up button I very rarely send out emails through the website but even if you want to contact the show and comment on a case that I am covering or suggest a show that I am covering that's another good way to do it if you would like to help with the production of the show you can also do that from corpsecreekpublishing.com click on the donate button buy me a cup of coffee or a pack of smokes you're interested in helping with the production of the show on a monthly basis you can go to tinyurl.com backslash patreon dc for as little as two dollars a month you can help with the production of this show monies raised for this will of course be going to newer equipment such as a better microphone and headset if you enjoy what I do, please consider subscribing wherever it is that you find your favorite co- podcasts. Also, please consider leaving a five-star review. They really do help the show reach more listeners. If you don't like the show, that's fine. Move along. We don't need any of your negativity here. 
I know we live in the age where everybody, if they find displeasure with something, has to let the entire world know, well, from me to you, fuck off. Alright, now that all of the plugs are out of the way, get yourself something to drink, sit back, relax, close your eyes, I've got my coffee, I've got my cigarettes, and i got a whole lot of awful to get out because it's been one hell of a week already. Let's go into the crypt. We left off last week, we were talking about Charles Miles Manson. Manson had been incarcerated off and on since his early years and at this point in our story it's the 1960s he is incarcerated the federal penitentiary at mcneil island i talked about this some in the last episode how he took guitar lessons from infamous bank robber alvin carpus and i also briefly touched on the fact that According to the book by journalist Tom O'Neill, Chaos, The Secret History of Charles Manson, the CIA, and the 1960s, he found evidence which led him to speculate that the long-held rumor that Manson may have been involved in the CIA's MK Ultra program was in fact reality. Some of the basis for this comes from the fact that McNeil Island was known as an area that in later decades the CIA admitted to conducting its mind control experiments. And there's been some speculation that later, once he was released from prison, he was able to manipulate the young women and men who fell under his sway, thanks in part to things that he had learned in this program. However, there is more to this particular theory than just that. We're not going to jump into all of the nuts and bolts of it. As fun as that may be, I do try and keep this show somewhat grounded in reality and provable, verifiable facts. So that's some of what we're going to be looking at today. It is known that when Manson was released from Terminal Island, On March 21st, 1967, he actually asked the authorities to keep him incarcerated as, at this point in his life, 32-year-old Manson had spent more time on the inside and on the outside, and he correctly surmised that he would not be able to get along in regular society. If you take the conspiracy theory side of things, this may have just been a line that his handlers instructed him to give to prison authorities upon being released so that they could cover their tails afterwards. In any event, Manson, who had initially been arrested and incarcerated in Los Angeles, was paroled to L.A. Not long after arriving in Los Angeles, Manson skipped town and moved to Berkeley, which for any other parole parolee would more likely than not have been a violation. However, Manson was able to get his parole transferred to San Francisco and he his parole officer was a man by the name of Roger Smith Smith was working on his doctoral in criminology as well as operating as a federal probation officer also of interest at this time, Smith was also working at the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic. According to some reports, the medical clinic received 
funding through a shell organization from the CIA. And this was done so that the medical clinic would carry out research under the umbrella of the NK Ultra program. The MK Ultra program in and of itself is not a conspiracy. It's something that the US government has admitted to. There were congressional hearings over this. And I am going to give you the simplest of the simple explanations what of what the MK Ultra program was. MK Ultra was a program that the CIA initiated that went on for decades. And basically, they were looking for ways to control the minds of individuals, be that agents from other governments, people who the U.S. government had deemed enemies of the state, such as the Black Panther Party, Basically, anyone who did not fall in line with the CIA and, by extension, the U.S. federal government's view on what a happy, productive member of society should be. They employed a lot of doctors across a number of different fields, and they did some pretty horrific stuff, such as funding LSD research and unwillingly dosing college students, members of militant organizations, prisoners, and subjecting them to various levels of torture. A good example, this is well known, Theodore Kaczynski, the Unabomber, was a willing participant in MK Ultra experimentation as well as thousands upon thousands of others throughout the country and again many without their consent or knowledge there are stories out there of the CIA dosing their own members at parties and get-togethers in order to see what happened and of those individuals who were dosed ending up taking their own lives or being committed to institutions for long periods of time after which they would be dosed again to continue the experiments on them. Now, while Manson was in Berkeley, he came across a young librarian by the name of Mary Bruner who ended up becoming his first known follower before requesting and receiving permission to move to the hate area of San Francisco, which was really the counterculture hub of California. Interesting uh, thing to note at this point is that Manson had been influenced by a number of outside sources at by this point which we know to have influenced him including the novel stranger in a strange land the scientology movement dale carnegie anton levey's church of satan which Manson would come into contact with once again when he was in San Francisco. So it's not ha hard to see how this social outcast who was extremely charismatic was able to get people to listen to what he was saying. You have to also understand Manson had been incarcerated for the majority of his life, and whether there was CIA involvement or not, at heart he was a con man, and he knew how to say the things that needed to be said in order to get other individuals with a similar mindset, that of a disenfranchised youth, youth to follow him. Once in San Francisco, Manson fell into the entire hippie movement, and from this point 
onward, it is known that he began visiting the free clinic quite frequently with his growing menagerie of young people who, it should be noted, were mostly female. During this period of time, the actual founder of the free clinic, David E. Smith, wrote that the change in Manson's personality was, quote-unquote, the most abrupt that Roger Smith had observed in his entire professional career. Remember, Roger Smith was Manson's parole officer at this period of time. It has been said that upon arriving in the hate with Mary Bruner in tow, Manson first encountered both LSD and methamphetamine. Whether or not this is true, a lot of people seem to swear and insist that this is so. My personal opinion, I have to believe that he would have encountered it either in L.A. or in Berkeley before arriving in San Francisco because it was so prevalent during this period of time, and especially in Berkeley of the late 1960s, which was a hotbed of countercultural leftist ideology, it would have been almost impossible for him to conduct business without encountering drugs. At some point, I haven't done a whole lot of research on this particular period, but at some point during this period of time, whether it was when they were in Berkeley or right after they arrived in San Francisco, the next member of the core that became the family joined, and that was Lynette Squeaky Frome, whom Manson convinced to come and live with him himself and Bruner and eventually he created a massive cadre of young people some of whom would become infamous such as Sexy Sadie, Susan Atkins, Leslie Van Houten, Linda Cassabian, Bobby Boussole who was a former musician and pornographic actor and Charles Tex Watson. These weren't the only members of the family, but they really, at least to many researchers, were the core of the family. Susan Denise Atkins, who was born May 7, 1948, in San Gabriel, California, came from a fairly standard background. In December of 1966, she decided that she was going to go to San Francisco over Christmas break. And when the friends who were supposed to go with her backed out, Atkins ended up going on her own. And during this period of time, she became associated through various people with the Church of Satan, in fact, there are still images of Atkins done up in makeup to portray a supplicant during a satanic rite being overseen by Anton Xander LaVey. These kind of things from the Church of Satan were fairly common during this period of time. It was all really to an attention grab to, you know, try and get new converts as well as to get the media talking about them as the women would habitually be appearing in the nude. Atkins also worked as a topless dancer during this time. And she eventually came into Manson's sphere of orbit after going to a house and finding him surrounded by a group of girls, he was playing guitar. According to Atkins, 
she completely lost herself in both his guitar playing and his singing. In her book, she describes this very intense meeting with Manson and how she came to believe that he was a messiah of sorts. This was in 1967, several weeks after this initial meeting, the house was raided by police and Atkins found herself without any place to stay. So Manson invited Atkins to join their Burgoing family, which she readily agreed to do. And during this period of time, as it had been before she joined, Manson was known to hold court, for lack of a better term, where mass amounts of LSD would be ingested while he pontificated about the world around them and their place in it. And many of his followers began to see Manson as something of a messiah. This included Atkins. They stayed in San Francisco up until the summer of 1968. And they lived as homeless people, really, crashing in houses where they could at times, staying outdoors, moving from place to place, all with the knowledge of Manson's parole officer, Roger Smith, who came to see Manson and his followers increasingly as during these drug-fueled sermons that Charles would give, there would also be massive group orgies, and any time you have things of that nature taking place, venereal diseases invariably crop up. Again, you have to remember, Manson wasn't just preaching to his core group of followers. Anybody who would listen was invited to participate in what they were doing. So they had individuals that they did not know partaking in this. None of them were bathing regularly by their own admissions. And it's almost as though Manson was doing his own mind control experiment on them. And some people have speculated that Manson's mind control experiment was a part of the larger mind control experiments being conducted by the CIA and that he was in fact doing all of this at the direction of his supposed handler, Roger Smith, who was getting his instructions from on high in Washington. Yes, it does sound crazy completely off the wall. There are some other aspects of the Manson and his family, however, that do leave, lend credence to this. One example is that Manson is known to have prostituted his followers out during their time in San Francisco, which eventually read, led to his arrest on July 31st, 1967, after he attempted to prevent the arrest of one of his followers, Ruth Ann Morehouse. Manson was pimping her out. Miraculously, Manson avoided being sent back to prison for this. Remember, he's still on federal probation and the charges were reduced to a misdemeanor and given three years probation. Later, when the family decided that they were going to pack up into a black school bus that they had procured, Roger Smith signed off on this on allowing Manson and his cadre of young people to move to Los Angeles because Manson believed that they could be music superstars. While got on their way to San Francisco, the bus ended up getting into an accident and going into a ditch. They were found by police officers sleeping naked and Manson was again arrested. However, he was very soon released 
and they were on their way once again. Manson would be arrested yet again a few days later on drug charges, only to be released and nothing said of it. This comes directly from Tom O'Neill's book, Chaos, and we will get back into this in just one moment. Me and Tommy, best selling author of the House of Silver Dolls, the Blood Gods trilogy, Maggie, a book which New York Times best selling author Keith Elliott Greenberg has called a classic detective story, well crafted, and a supernatural vortex. Maggie, the name was burned into Lieutenant Carl Jablonski's mind like a brand had been since the night of the fire. He doubted he would ever forget that night or how she had danced in the flames of her burning home. Maggie, who was she and why did no one in Kaya's Crossing seem interested in talking about her or her family? These were questions without answers, quandaries that drove Carl on as he explored the darkest of the town's secrets desperate to unravel the knots that tied everything together. Maggie, Carl felt haunted by a visage, even as the local reporter, George Murphy, told them of the blood-soaked history that lay along their path and the horrors that it held. None of it seemed real, and yet it was. The sacrifices, the screams, the pact with the nameless ones, and the hell that she had endured. Maggie, Hers was a crime begging to be solved, and he and George are the only ones with enough heart to do it. The real question is, will they survive long enough to do it? Maggie, available 11, 30, 2021, in paperback and hardcover. Ebook pre-orders are now available at Amazon.com. Only from Corpse Creek Publishing. You have been warned. We are back. Now, whether or not you believe that Manson was a tool of the CIA is subjective at this point. It is extremely striking and odd that a convicted felon repeatedly was able to avoid jail time for, you know, his various activities while on the outside. And while Tom O'Neill does not expressly say that, you know, Manson was a CIA operative, he leads it open to the interpretation of the reader. And that's what I'm going to do with this particular bit of information. Again, it is really odd for a convicted felon with a busload of young women, some of whom had children with them, to be arrested and then released. And there were a number of other brushes with the law during this period of time and in the preceding year that largely came without consequence for Manson and his followers. They got away scot-free and continued on doing as they would, which was basically dealing drugs, stealing, and prostitution, taking drugs, and basically living life as they saw fit on a daily basis. It should be noted before we get into their time in Los Angeles, that Roger Smith, when he started as a federal parole officer, he had numerous parolees who were to report into him. By the time he finished being a parole officer, the only parolee that he had was Charles Manson, and it basically became his job to keep Manson and his girls from getting locked up. Manson and Smith also are known to have 
had an extremely tight bond with Smith being the legal guardian of one of Manson's children. And Smith also attempted at one period of time during their stay in San Francisco to get per- Manson permission to travel down to Mexico, which is, again, unheard of for a parolee, whether they're at the state level or the federal level. Not long after arriving in Los Angeles, Manson was able to get himself introduced to both Harry Melcher, who was a music producer and the son of Doris Day, as well as Brian Wilson, who was a member of the Beach Boys. Now, fingers have been pointed back and forth over the decades since the crimes took place as to whether or not Melcher actually promised that he was going to get Manson a recording contract. That's besides the point. There is some evidence to suggest that he did, just as there is evidence to suggest that he didn't, and that Melcher was just keeping Manson around so that he could have access to his girls. In any event, the Manson family began moving around Los Angeles, interacting with Melcher, other famous individuals, and he continued to build his following. During this period of time, core members of the Manson family, Charles Pex Watton, Bobby Boussoli, and Leslie Van Houten would join Manson's family. And I do want to point out the family wasn't some big secret that nobody in Los Angeles knew about. Anybody saying that is completely full of it because the family moved as a pack all around the Los Angeles County area, spending time in Topanga Canyon and Laurel Canyon, where it's said that the music scene of the 1960s grew out of, and it's also been said was a hub for a CIA operation. Again, as before, Manson continued his pimping his girls out, committing petty crimes, selling drugs, all while pursuing a career as a musician. The group became fairly well known in Los Angeles. We're going to dive into some of this here and now. On April 6th, 1968, Dennis Wilson, who was the drummer for the Beach Boys, was driving through Malibu when he saw Patricia Cronwinkle and Ella Jo Bailey hitchhiking. He decided to pick the two girls up and drop them off at their destination. A few days later, on April 11th, Wilson saw the two girls hitchhiking again, and this time, thinking that he might be able to get into their pants, he decided to bring them back with him to his home at 14400 Sunset Boulevard. According to historians, while they were driving, he told the young women about his association with the Maharishi, and they in turn informed him that they had their own spiritual guru by the name of Charlie. Wilson brought the girls to his house before proceeding on to a recording session. When he returned later that night, he was met by Manson in the driveway. Afterwards, he went into the house and discovered that at least a dozen young women were staying in his home. According to Manson, he had met Wilson prior to this at a friend's home while they were, he was staying in San Francisco, and he, meaning Manson, had gone to this friend's house in order to score some weed. According to an article published in Rave magazine, Wilson initially was fascinated by Manson and his followers, so much so that he referred to the man as the 
wizard, Manson ended up staying in the house with various members of his family for the next several months. And it was during this period of time that Wilson introduced Manson to Melcher. Wilson, who had expressed interest in Manson and his music, introduced Manson to Melcher in the hopes that Melcher would be able to further Manson's musical aspirations. Manson ended up meeting Melcher at the home he was staying at, 10050 Cielo Drive. At this period of time, Melcher was living there with his girlfriend, actor Candace Bergen, and a musician by the name of Mark Lindsay. Melcher supposedly had designs on recording Manson as well as making a documentary film about the commune that had sprung up around him. However, again, there's speculation about this. Some have said that Melcher was simply you know, leading Manson along in order to have access to both his cadre of young women as well as the drugs that were frequently around them. In any event, Manson took Melcher's interest seriously enough that he eventually did in fact record for Melcher. While the family was staying at Wilson's house, they ended up causing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage, which eventually led to Wilson moving out, and we'll get to that in just a moment. One interesting thing to come of all of this came from an interview with Record Magazine in late 1968 where Wilson stated, When I met Manson, I found he had great musical ideas. We're writing together now. He's dumb in some ways, but I accept his approach and I have learned from him. Wilson further went on to state that he was living with 17 women. Going on to further state, if anything, they're supporting me. I had all the rich status symbols, Rolls Royce, Ferrari, home after home. Then I woke up, gave away 50 to 60% of my money. Now I live in one small room with one candle, and I'm happy finding myself. And this is something interesting to note, because Wilson had a chronic history of both drug usage as well as alcoholism. And it seemed that Manson was able to prey on individuals with this type of makeup fairly easily. They were very susceptible to what Manson was spewing. In September of 1968, the Beach Boys recorded one of Manson's songs known as Cease to Exist. They reworked this as Never Learn Not to Love. Wilson further went on to state that Manson was not credited for writing the song as payment for the amount of damage that was done to Wilson's home. Because of everything that was going on at the house, some stories state that Wilson became afraid of Charles Manson and moved out of the home, leaving Charlie and his family there. Eventually, Manson and his followers were evicted from the home. When the damage was totaled up afterwards, it was found that Manson and his girls had stolen virtually anything of value from inside the mansion. One story that circulated, and personally I don't find it to be truthful, is that Manson delivered a bullet to Wilson's housekeeper when he sought to further communication with him, and in doing so, he gave a rather threatening message to be delivered to Wilson. A collaborator of the Beach Boys, Van Dyke Parks, stated later, One day, Charles Manson brought a bullet 
out and showed it to Dennis, who asked, what's this? And Mansa replied, it's a bullet. Every time you look at it, I want you to think how nice it is your kids are still safe. While Grenis, Dennis grabbed Manson by the head and threw him to the ground and began pummeling him. I heard about it, but I wasn't there. The point is, though, Dennis Wilson wasn't afraid of anybody. My personal opinion is that this likely never, ever happened. Manson did not seem to be the type of individual who is confrontational. Well, I can see him going and leaving the bullet and possibly a somewhat ominous message for Dennis Wilson, the idea that he would blatantly state to somebody who had what he wanted that he should be thankful every day that his family is safe, doesn't jibe with the Charles Manson of the 1960s, at least not in any of the readings that I have encountered. This sounds more like revisionist history of someone trying to protect the reputation of their friend. More likely in reality, Wilson was terrified of Manson, and reasonably so. Manson was a hardened, convicted criminal, and he had a ever-growing menagerie of young women and men surrounding him who were willing to do his bidding. Other sources state that Wilson was aware that Manson and his followers were committing murders, and this was the reason why he distanced himself from Manson as well as evicted them from the house. One member of the Beach Boys stated in their autobiography that Wilson had quote-unquote witnessed Manson shooting a black man in half with an M16 before disposing of the body inside of a well. Terry Melcher stated that Wilson was aware that the family had been murdering people and he was, quote, so freaked out he didn't just didn't want to live anymore. He was afraid, and he thought he should have gone to the authorities, but he didn't, and the rest of it happened. Again, I think this is more revisionist history to get people's eyes on books as well as names in paper. I highly doubt that if Manson's and his followers were committing murders at this point in early to mid-1968. They would have let anyone know about it. They most certainly would not have shown someone who was a member of, you know, the musical elite, you know, them committing an act of murder. Manson was far too smart and far too wily, even strung out on LSD to allow an outsider, which is what they always saw individuals such as Melcher and Wilson as, to see them committing such a high-level offense. I am going to call it here for the week. Next week, we will be getting back into Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski and possibly discussing the murders that took place when Manson and his family decided to exact revenge on Terry Melcher. Hope you've enjoyed the Death Cast this week. Again, if you enjoy it, please leave a five-star review. Subscribe to the show, share it on social media. Until next time, the Death Cast is a production of Corpse Creek Publishing. Stay morbid.